Well, here I am. <laughs> Here I am, <laughs> the last guy between, uh, I am the last one between you and the food. <laughs> so, and my wife, Kitty, who you, some of you may know, cheekily asked me, well, what are you going to be speaking about, Bob? And I said, oh, about spent fuel from reactors. She said, oh, is this going to be a four-day marathon? <laughs> And I said, no, I think they, they might get it in 30 minutes. So anyway, as they say, uh, put your uh, trays in an upright position, fasten your seat belts, and off we go. <laughs> I don't need to dwell on this. I think much of this was presented yesterday. Uh, the Fukushima accident clearly uh, demonstrated uh, the dangers of spent nuclear fuel storage. Uh, the explosions exposed the pools themselves, showed how shoddy construction was, and that they basically are warehouses never intended to hold the uh, quantities that uh, they are now holding. Uh, this is something I borrowed, or some artists may call it stealing, from Gordon Edwards. And Gordon provided, I thought, was a, an excellent explanation as to why these spent fuel po pools pose greater dangers. Each pool contains irradiated fuel from several years of operation. It contains several cores, not just one core from a reactor. They do not have strong containment. They do not have the secondary barrier of concrete and steel. In the United States, we have spent fuel storage in buildings that you would find at big box stores and car dealerships. Uh, several pools are now completely open to the atmosphere. The, these pools of this particular design are 100 feet above the ground. And now that their stru the structural integrity is of serious question, uh, further aftershocks and quakes might cause drainage or toppling of the pool itself. Once the water starts to drain, you have to understand that after a point at which the water drains, uh, the radiation levels become so prohibitively large that they will actually prevent emergency crews from actually intervening because then you're getting at uh, lethal dose rates on the order of 500 R per hour at maybe 50, 60, 70 yards. Uh, and that the loss of, of water could result in the overheating from decay of the fuel, which then caused melting and then what's called a exothermic reaction or spontaneous uh, fire of the zirconium cladding or the metal tubing around the uh, uh, the fuel, uh, which could then result in a, a, a large deposit of radioactive material. Uh, when I was in the energy department, we looked at a spent fuel pool problem at the Hanford site, and uh, it had been ignored for decades. And at the closeout briefing, we asked, well, what would happen if there was an earthquake and the water drained and there was a hem and a ha and hem and a ha? And finally, some old timer basically said, well, there would be a fire that would make Chernobyl look like a pimple on a pumpkin. Uh, irradiated fuel, this is what a spent fuel element looks like. It's extremely radioactive, as some of you all know. Um, being anywhere near this, will you'll receive a lethal dose. These materials are radiotoxic. We've heard a lot of explanation about what that means. Uh, but I think there is official recognition by the United States government itself through the Government Accountability Office who considers spent nuclear fuel to be considered one of the most hazardous substances on the earth. And what I want to talk about is essentially the environment, safety, and health burden which has been imposed upon us that we have to start taking seriously from the, these, this detritus. Uh, I'm not going to be talking about health effects. I'm not going to talk about radiation risks. I'm just going to talk about the detritus. Uh, the spent fuel pool at uh, Fukushima number four contained roughly about 37 million curies of cesium-137, or of long-lived radioactivity, I take that back, and about 10 times the amount of cesium-137 that was released by the Chernobyl accident. Uh, this is, is, should be a, a, a very, very high priority. Uh, it's not going to be easy. Uh, this is not simply getting a crane in there and lifting it out as if it's some sort of cargo on a ship and putting it somewhere else. You're talking about having to lift objects that are on the order of 100 tons 
uh, you can see that the infrastructure, this is an early photo, a lot of the debris and other things have been removed and you can now see the top, but the, the basic infrastructure that allows a safe movement and removal of the spent fuel was destroyed. It has to somehow be restored. All the spent fuel has to be done underwater with, with uh, nuclear safety rated cranes and it has to be transferred into a network of uh, other pools and what, what you'll see here is uh, what I mean to say is that this is a typical pool setup for a boiling water reactor. It isn't just one pool. You'll see it involves an infrastructure including what's called a staging pool and then up there is some people like to call this the upper, upper pool. These are usually kept empty and are required or are filled when they start to move stuff in and out. So this infrastructure somehow has to be replaced and refurbished uh, in addition to having a crane somewhere outside that building, in addition to shoring up the structural integrity of this building. Uh, we don't know the condition of the racks. We don't know whether the damage of the racks is such that they, the fuel assemblies are stuck and whether that's going to be a problem. But assuming everything moves swimmingly well, you're looking at a rate of transfer of somewhere on the order of, of there's about 1,331 assemblies. Uh, if we're lucky, we're moving probably nine or 10 assemblies uh, at a time, and that takes a, quite a bit of time and effort. So uh, then, then those assemblies will have to be put into some sort of dry cast, thick walled concrete and steel uh, container. That's gonna have to dry out. It's then have to be lifted up by a very large crane placed in some sort of transport facility and probably moved to the central pool where they have to thin that pool out because they don't have enough room for the, for the uh, spent fuel in the radioactive ruins right now. This is a, a layup for a pressurized water reactor and you'll notice that uh, pressurized water reactors do not have elevated pools. The pools tend to be in buildings adjacent to the reactor. Uh, many of the uh, of the uh, spent fuel pool storage areas have cavities beneath them, which uh, if there are drainage and other events uh, could lead to preferential flow. And again, you see, this is, not, this is a fairly complex system. This is not just a pool of water with a crane. It involves a great deal of care and transfer through tubes, through cavities, into the pool, and into racks. And there's also, you have to be concerned very much of how you're configuring uh, the, the storage of these spent fuel pool, you don't just put a batch here and just forget about them. You have to do them in a, a very specific way. And uh, furthermore, they're now having to do even greater th things to do checkerboarding to reduce the risk of ignition. Uh, since the early 1980s, the U.S. Neg Regulatory Commission, with the expectation that the United States would open a, a permanent repository for the, for the permanent disposal of uh, spent fuel and defense high-level radioactive waste, basically approved uh, high-density storage. These pools are now storing four to five times more spent fuel than what they were originally designed to hold. The pools were originally intended to be temporary storage facilities for a period of five years. And therefore, they did not impose or require them to have what are called nuclear safety rated defense in depth requirements. These pools do not have secondary containments. Some of these pools have buildings with tin roofs. As I said, some of these pool structures are you would find the kind of structure you would expect to find at a Costco, a Walmart, or a Ford dealership. Uh, they, are, they do not require them to have redundant power. They do not require them to have uh, uh, separate independent water makeup capability. And only after the Fukushima accident did the Nuclear Regulatory Commission get around to requiring the reactor operators for the first time to have instrumentation in their, their control rooms to tell them water levels, water chemistry, and water temperature of the pools. Before that, people had to go and look in the room. And there were occasions, there was at least one occasion when they didn't do that for a while and discovered the water level dropped dramatically and uh, there have been some problems. This is a comparison of the amount of spent fuel that it, with the four damaged reactors with uh, reactors of the same design, roughly the same design uh, in the United States. You see, and this is by the number of assemblies. 
you'll see that the, the pools in the United States have much more spent fuel in them than, than those in Japan. Uh, and that's because they become uh, indefinite storage uh, modes for the nuclear industry because it saves money. This is a snapshot. This, it took me a while to do this, this slog, but this is a snapshot of the what I call the intermediate and long-lived radioactivity of the U.S. nuclear spent fuel inventory uh, that's based on some rather conservative assumptions. It's based on a 23-year decay time. Uh, each uh, uh, This factors in the different uh, amount of radioactivity and radionuclides that are generated by the different reactor designs, pressurized water reactors, boiling water reactors. And it also assumes what they call a burn-up period uh, where this, essentially the, the spent fuel is, uh, is irradiated for no longer than three years or 33,000 megawatt days per ton. It's just a snapshot. It's a fairly conservative estimate uh, because uh, since the 1990s, uh, the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission have, been, have basically allowed our reactor operators to double the time of uh, irradiating uh, fuel in the reactors by increasing the amount of uh, uranium-235 from 3.5 to roughly 5 percent. And so uh, right now, the U.S. nuclear power fleet is allowed to operate at the highest burn-up rates in the world. And this, and this is really motivated by economics and not necessarily by waste management. Uh, there, there are now some questions being raised. In the summer of last year, uh, the, uh, some of the engineers from the National Research Council put this in their magazine. It said the technical basis for the spent fuel currently being discharged, high utilization burn of fuels is not well established. In addition, spent fuel that may have degraded after extended storage may present new, new obstacles to safe transport. This is a short, give you an idea of what I mean to say when you get high burn up. Uh, this is just the comparison of the generation of cesium, uh, cesium-137 from uh, the previous level of burn ups to the current level of burn ups, looking at the different reactor designs. And this is very important because we are now getting into matters of decay heat and thermal heat. We've talked a lot about radiation, uh, but for reactors uh, and for reactor storage safety and disposal, the safety of permanent disposal, a very, very key factor is thermal heat that is given off by decay. Uh, strontium-90 gives off uh, nearly one watt per gram. Uh, cesium-147, about 0.42 watts per gram. Uh, these are, these, this is a lot of heat it, uh, being given off, and uh, this uh, uh, it has a, a lot of um, implications. Um, I won't get into the details because of the time that's up, but what I will say is that they have been observing elongation of the cladding, the thinning of the cladding, the, the fission gas pressure inside the cladding is two to three times higher. They are experiencing much greater hydriding of the spent fuel cladding itself. Uh, and the reactors, uh, some certain types of reactors are experiencing rather large amounts of what's called grid to rod fretting from being from these high burn ups simply from rubbing. Uh, on the grid, there is more debris that falls into, these reactors are not pristine environments. They have debris, they have parts, they have bolts, things that fall in on them. They're churning away, they're vibrating away, and they will cause a lot of wear and tear on the, on the cladding. We're talking about cladding, by the way, that is between 0 0.04 millimeters and 0 0.08 millimeters. What does that mean? Think about extra heavy duty aluminum foil. That's how thick the cladding is uh, surrounding the pellets. So uh, this is a, a, a fairly important issue. This is a projection that was done by the Nuclear Energy Institute in 2010 of how much uh, spent fuel they plan to be generating and how much they want to keep in wet storage. This, this scenario basically looks at uh, they're going to be maintaining wet storage until the bitter end of these reactors at high density. Uh, spent fuel pools are going to run out of, uh, of storage by the year 2015. So there, the industry is, this is one of the big elements, is forcing the industry into dry storage, but not to thinning out their pools. 
The idea is to keep these pools filled to the brim by, by packing them close, more closely together. And, uh, at, and then when they run out of that, they'll, they'll then get around to building dry casts. But this sort of is another graph that shows uh, that by the year 2015, the pools are going to be maxing out, even with this high-density configuration. I mentioned decay heat. This is a very, very important issue, as I said. Um, from the point of view of safety in terms of, of uh, spent fuel storage, the loss of water is a very serious matter for spent fuel. The National Academy of Sciences basically, I think, came up with a good explanation of what happens when you lose water and it heats up. Uh, the zirconium basically will spontaneously combust at somewhere around 800 degrees centigrade. They said it is strongly exothermic. The result could be a runaway oxidation referred to as a zirconium cladding fire that proceeds as a burn front, e.g. as seen in a forest fire or firework sparkler. This is sort of what a spent fuel fire would look like. And it's largely due to the enormous decay heat and the reactivity of zirconium. Uh, in 2003, several colleagues and I had, were stricken from the Christmas card lists of a lot of people in the nuclear industry. Uh, when we published a paper uh, basically raising the concern about the, 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 the vulnerabilities of spent fuel pools, particularly to acts of terror and other other events like earthquakes. And uh, what, what we did is we modeled, we took the, the literature of the last 25, 30 years of nuclear spent fuel pool safety and took it to its logical extreme. And this is uh, what happened is that, of course, we, uh, uh, the nuclear industry, the, nu the Nuclear Regulatory Commission was not happy with us and uh, issued quite a few uh, statements and papers, et cetera, in rebuttal. And this prompted the U.S. Congress to ask the National Academy of Sciences to sort this out. Uh, we then went before a special panel, and this is what uh, one of my colleagues, Frank von Hippel, presented to them as to what we're looking at in a uh, sort of a generic sense of what might happen if you have a pool fire. Uh, what this graph basically says, you could have a pool fire uh, at a, a commercial nuclear power plant in the United States could be as large as 60, ti 60 times greater uh, than the, um, uh, essentially the cordon sanitaire uh, around Chernobyl. Uh, we also provided some damage estimates, just the standard damage estimates that the industry uses to give you an idea of what the monetary possible ca carcinogenic uh, uh, estimates would be just using the, the standard uh, formulas that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission uses. Um, and uh, this is what, the, what it looks like. You know, these, the, these, this kind of accident, such as, such as Chernobyl, similar to Fukushima, deal body blows to entire nations. They are highly destabilizing to the stability of an entire country when you have events like this happen. Uh, the National Academy came back a year later, and this is what they had to say. They basically agreed with us. Uh, they basically pointed out that these, these pools are particularly vulnerable to terrorist attacks and that these fires could be quite, quite significant. Uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission essentially uh, flipped a bird and uh, uh, re really did nothing uh, to acknowledge the importance of this study as far as I can tell. You've heard yesterday from David Lockbaum that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has made the statement that the uh, dangers of, of dry versus wet storage are the same. This happens to be a chart that I took out of a document by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission Emergency Operations Center. As a recovering bureaucrat of the Department of Energy, I'm familiar with operating in, in parallel universes. <laughs> And this is, the, this is the other universe. This is the emergency planning center. This is the data that they're using to do desktop planning uh, and their exercises. This is based on the RASCAL code model. And this gives you an idea. And, it, and this is the source. It's on the internet if you wanted to bother to find out. And this involves a reactor, interestingly enough, called the San Onofre Nuclear Generating Station. And 
uh, the, it's a workbook. It, it explains, you know, how to use this code, and it gives you problems. And it says, well, you've just received a phone call from the uh, staff at, at, at San Onofre, and they've had an earthquake. The roof is gone. The pool is draining. They've put a full fresh coral load in there, and the, wa and the tops are already being exposed. What do you do? How do you ascertain what, what to expect? And this is what the answer was. The amount of radioactivity that would be released in the environment would be 86 million curies. About 26 million would be cesium-137. Your doses within the 1 to 10 miles would essentially be prompt lethal to killing half of the people or giving the LD50 dose. 450 to 5,200 rems. These are all what you would call oblation doses, destruction of the thyroid, period, for people within a 10-mile radius. Um, this, again, is the same report. This is interesting because it shows you what the, what's called the, uh, the, fra the fraction, uh, release fraction from a cladding fire. It's at the very uh, end of this one here. 100% of the noble gases get out. About 70% of the halogens, which are you know, your radioactive iodine, 30% of your radio cesium gets out, and then you see these smaller fractions estimated be, to be released here. And these here are really the biggies when you have a large radiation release, and we've talked about this before. And I think that this, this, th these noble gases here have been entirely dismissed without proper justification, especially when you're talking about weather conditions that would uh, create immersion doses and very large exposures. Uh, and the halogens we've known about, our radioiodine and the cesium. But this is the NRC's parallel universe here. This is the inside versus what they say to the outside. Uh, they also, also gave an exercise about, well, a terrorist has basically put a shape charge on a cask at the Prairie Island Nuclear Station. And how do you figure out what the release will be and what the doses would be? Well, this is the comparison. Uh, a cask would release as much as 34,000 curies of radioactivity. Uh, by the way, this is on a logarithmic scale because I, otherwise I couldn't uh, present it that way. And versus 36 me megacuries, your doses, everybody within a 10-mile radius essentially would have a, a near lethal, if not a lethal, prompt lethal dose. Your off-site doses, now at Prairie Island, as some of you might know, that reactor is Chicken Jowl with a small Indian tribe. So these are, the do these are their dose estimates. Uh, you know, 1.9 to 4 rem total effective dose equivalent, 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 rems. I'm sorry for the, the typo here. I was busy doing this yesterday uh, for thyroid. Uh, your thyroid doses, your total effective uh, dose equivalent are just off the chart. I may add, by the way, do you know what's in the 10 mile radius of the San Onofre Nuclear Power Station? the world's largest United States Marine Corps base, Camp Pendleton. And that within that 10 mile radius are 64,000 people who are Marines and support people. And I'm curious whether anybody has thought about what this means to our national security. What this means, has anyone bothered to call up the base commander and say, are you aware of this? Have you, are you ready for this if something like this were to happen? Probably not. Uh, a lot has been written, said about Fukushima. What I find interesting about certain things are, th are things that are usually not said. And what, was, what I found to be one of the most interesting uh, lessons that I gained from the Fukushima disaster is that they had nine casks uh, at the site and they were unscathed by the earthquake and the tsunami and all the other aftermath. That's a very important finding, very important finding. Uh, we recommended in 2003 that we return our, these spent fuel pools to their original purpose, which is for 
temporary storage for a five-year period to allow decay heat to move them, and we suggested that they dry out, they thin out these pools and restore them to original use and place the remainder into dry hardened storage. We estimated it would cost about $3.5 billion to $7 billion. It would take about 10 years. Uh, the Electric Power Research Institute recently came out with a study and said it would be about $3.9 billion. And they said it would mean, mean a lot of reactor downtime and they would not make a lot of money as they are. I believe they treat these reactors like ATM machines. Uh, if you were to, if the consumer were to pay for this, this is how much it would cost to do this. And we're, we're looking at a, a, an enormous reduction in the potential consequences and risks and hazards of doing this. Now, these are the types of spent fuel casts. The one on the right, uh, the Castor, I consider to be the Cadillac or the Mercedes. The Holtec, I consider to be the Geo. Um, one thing we have to keep in mind right now is that we are stuck. The whole framework for the uh, disposal of, uh, of high-level radioactive waste has collapsed in this country. The Yucca Mountain site has been pulled off the table. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission's waste confidence rule, in other words, their rule that says we can jam as much spent fuel as possible into these pools has been rejected by a federal court largely on the grounds that their assumptions about the consequences of spent fuel fire, pool fires did not pass the laugh test. And so they are now embarked on a very time-consuming environmental impact statement. As I said, the maximum high-density spent fuel pools are going to reach their maximum storage by 2015. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is that we have a, uh, an abundance of, of uh, a large and, and long-term abundance of natural gas, which is making uh, these older single-unit reactors more and more vulnerable economically. This is putting more pressure on, on this industry, who are much more economically motivated than they are with respect to waste management. And we also have to keep in mind that we have large amounts of defense high-level radioactive waste that are stranded. Uh, the recommendations of the Blue Ribbon Commission, uh, they are the same we've heard before, ex except somebody else ought to do it other than the Energy Department. And I won't get into the reasons, but the bottom line is that these recommendations are going to take many, many decades if they are actually implemented and uh, before any, any major changes. Uh, just a brief word about military high-level radioactive waste. They, we have about 100 million gallons uh, in tanks that are larger than most state capital domes. Roughly a third of them have leaked. Uh, after 30 years, we've spent about $120 billion trying to stabilize them, and we've been able to stabilize about 11% of the radioactivity. These, these, this is a, a matter of very high national concern and priority because we're talking about protecting uh, streams like the Columbia River the Savannah River, the drinking water supply, the southeastern coastal plain of the United States. These are very important issues. My conclusion, we've been looking for a place to dispose of these wastes for actually close to 50 years now, close to 60 years rather. Uh, but one thing I think we need to understand and have to come to terms with is that uh, some of the largest concentrations of radioactivity on the planet are gonna remain in storage at US reactors. I think this is something you have to think about uh, very seriously for the indefinite future. Uh, I think that we have put the disposal cart before the storage horse. We've always thought that we would find a place and there was no need to, to, to take the extraordinary steps that nations like Germany have done to protect their spent fuel. And I think we need a national policy that, w that basically takes uh, the hazards of these pools, reduces the hazards, and establishes a safe storage policy before we start to find a, a, a re geologic repository. Stair storage and stabilization of military high-level waste should also be national pri priorities. This is all going to be quite expensive. And as I said, the cost of fixing America's high-level radioactive waste storage vulnerabilities are high. The costs of doing too little are incalculable. Thank you.